Greetings and welcome to another Educator Innovator webinar. It's Monday, May 4th, and it's a great time to discuss learning by making and introduce constructionism. I am your host, Jessica Parker, an associate professor at Sonoma State University and the director of the Maker Certificate Program. Before we get started, we want to acknowledge the organizations that make this webinar possible. Thanks so much to Educator Innovator, Transforming Learning Technologies Lab at Stanford, the Maker Certificate Program at Sonoma State, and the Creativity Lab at Lighthouse Charter School in Oakland, California. Today, our guests are both educational researchers and practitioners who will introduce us to constructionism, a learning theory that grounds making and tinkering, and they will also share some big ideas that guide the theories and practices of making and education. Our panelists work in a number of different settings, including higher education in the learning sciences field and K-12 school settings in California and Pennsylvania two states that I love. <laughs> they are here today to share their observations and findings and specific examples when it comes to learning and making. So let's let our guests introduce themselves. Uh, Kylie, can we start with you? Sure. So my name is Kylie Pepler. Um, I am an associate professor here at Indiana University in the learning sciences. So I study the science of learning, um, particularly in the arts. And I'm also the, the director of the creat creativity labs here. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Naomi, how about you? Sounds good. I am Naomi Thompson. I'm a second year student in the Learning Sciences at Indiana University. I'm in a doctoral program and Dr. Kelly Pepler is my advisor. I am interested in sort of intersections of um, art and craft and STEM, especially in informal learning spaces. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. Wonderful. And we have to add Indiana to as a state that we also love. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us today. Aileen, how about yourself? Hi, I'm Aileen Owens. I'm Director of Technology and Innovation at South Fayette School District near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, what we're doing is building a computational thinking initiative, K-12, through where uh, we integrate STEAM, uh, design thinking, and maker spaces um, to help students with constructive thinking. Wonderful. All right, Krista, last but not least. Hi, my name is Krista Flores. I work at the Hillbrook School and I've been a science teacher here for four years. And during that time I was, I've become the Maker Ed champion in a lot of the way that I address things in my own um, pedagogy. Um, I teach everything through a problem-based lens. And in this year I'm half-time science teacher and half-time Maker Ed coordinator. I sort of man the lab you see behind me and I'm just physically present to assist with any projects that are going on at the school. Great. Thanks so much, panelists. One more thing before we get started. If you're watching this Hangout from the Educator Innovator blog page, we really encourage you to jump into the chat room to converse with others who are watching. We'll be posting links to resources there throughout the webinar. All right, so let's dive in. Kylie, Naomi, can you kind of situate for us what in the world is constructionism and how can it help us make sense or even analyze what we're seeing when it comes to making and tinkering? Right. Well, if you're, you know, making and tinkering right now, you're probably a constructionist and you don't even know it. Um, you probably have heard of Jean Piaget and his theories of constructivism probably once, you know, a long time ago in your, your undergraduate education courses. Um, but for those of you that haven't heard of him, um, you know, the constructivism, sort of the V word of the two, um, Jean Piaget was a Swiss psychologist with this background in biology that really studied children and how they became active and motivated learners. And he started to notice that children construct knowledge based on their experiences over time. And so they would interact with the physical and social environment to kind of change their mental models or schemas. Pepper was a student and sort of a protege of, of Piaget's, and Piaget had uh, notably said that no one understood this work better than, than Pepper himself. He came to us sort of like out of the world of, of AI and, and um, you know, kind of the STEM world, so to speak, and he was uh, situated at, at the MIT Media Lab. And so Pepper expanded on um, Piaget's earlier notice, uh, um, theories of constructivism for us to kind of clarify um, this notion of constructionism. Um, constructionism, if you're in the art room or if you're in um, the maker space or if you're in these other spaces, it helps us to really start to think about that, that it's not just, uh, just re uh, reformulating these mental models in our mind, but this actual construction of this external artifact is actually important in the learning process. And so designing and sharing artifacts within a com uh, community is a key conductor for learning. 
And so it starts to really start to shape our understanding. So in problem-based learning, it's not just the solving of the problem, but it's the production of this artifact that becomes important. Um, so Pepper called this often what we'll call an object to think with today. And so these objects to think with a lot of times become internalized over time. You know, think about how you might solve a problem if you've, you've been coding with Scratch. You might actually think through and use Scratch internally um, to think about how you might put that code together. If you're, if you're thinking about, you know, designing or shaping something, um, you know, maybe that's sewing a new quilt. Uh, you're actually going to think with the materials. So these, these external materials start to become internalized and allow us to solve even higher frame functions over time. Um, and so you see this, this translation from our physical experience into our, our mental experiences. My work starts to argue that these artifacts that we produce over time start to have real power in the world. And so as we start to uh, create something, think about last time you created a painting or wrote a paper or created um, any type of external artifact or, or model. Um, it starts to clarify your own thinking. You know, how many of us started off writing a paper and all of a sudden you started looking at it and reading it and thinking, actually, you know, that's not exactly what I meant to say. You thought you had this great vision, but then you started taking it in a different direction. Um, so the relationship between the artifact and the self is there, but also think about how the artifact becomes a social uh, place for us to converge. How many of us think we understood something when we had it in conversation? We go to write it down, and it further clarifies this interaction. Um, so this could be, uh, you know, kind of the social conversation around um, the makerspace objects that you're creating. Could be around the painting. Could be about the writing. It's really important that we have that physical artifact for us to touch base on, and it clarifies our ideas and the relationships. These artifacts also start to, to reflect ourselves. Think about the portfolio of work. You know, just seeing uh, Krista's space there, I could see so many of the artifacts that start to define her space. Um, behind Eileen, you know, all of these paintings start to tell us a little bit about her kids, but also more about the space that she's been constructing in, in her schools. And so these, these artifacts start to have um, cultural and social and historical significance. You know, we are a culture um, that's engaged in this maker movement at this, this uh, juncture between technology and traditional kinds of materials. So it's important as kids start to create these artifacts, that they start to house them in portfolios over time and to start to, to, to um, pull them together um, to reflect this body of work. So today we're going to kind of open up the conversation. We're going to talk a little bit more about what these theories all mean, but also how practitioners are using them in their everyday spaces. Uh, Naomi, do you want to say any more? Uh, yeah, no, I think that it's funny how you started this to say that uh, you're probably a constructionist and you don't even know it yet because definitely coming into this program, that's sort of where I was starting to think. I knew that there were really powerful connections between education and making. Somehow I didn't know about this maker movement. I didn't know anything about it, but I knew that there was something really powerful there. And so to sort of be able to dive into this theory and understand sort of what those some of those mental and artificial or um, artifactual sort of connections are um, and how they manifest themselves in ways to share with other people and create cultural meaning out of those things that we make is a really interesting opportunity um, and a really fun place for exploration right now. Wonderful. Thanks so much, you two, for opening that up and kind of allowing us to dive into the topic. So Eileen and Krista. Um, does anything about what Kylie and Naomi kind of offered really resonate with you? And if so, how so? I think that there is such an emotional attachment to the things they make, which um, they actually spoke about. Um, they personalize with it. It's, um, to me, it's a sense of them being empowered. They, um, you know, when you think of young children, they don't have a lot of power in the world, but the minute they start to create, they have become empowered and um, they, again, are uh, emotionally attached, so much so that uh, when you're getting them to do re uh, to do an iteration, uh, sometimes it's hard for them to break down. You know what are the possibilities of, um, of creating a, a newer uh, piece that uh, has you know greater value. Um, so I think, yeah, it's 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 very it's a wonderful opportunity. I, it resonates strongly with me because I have a, a personal example of constructionism, which is this whole process of teaching. I've been a science teacher for over a decade now, and I 
um, I went to teacher's college and I learned how to do inquiry science um, and then the maker movement kind of happened and that kind of threw a new wrench in it, pun intended. And uh, what I'm learning is that even though I had all the training and the theory, like I knew Piaget and Dewey were all good, I didn't really know in a real life context what that even meant. And so now seeing kids building artifacts, um, and the artifacts thing is key, right? Because constructivism is almost impossible to see. So unless you're having the kids reflecting constantly and sort of saying, I knew that, now I know this, it's hard to measure the constructivism going on in someone's head. Um, whereas with an artifact, boom, they didn't know how to make something, now they know how to make it. There's this visible learning that's taking place. And if you use the portfolios, it's a really good way to sort of see that journey going through. Um, an example that I have today is that um, one of the seventh graders are doing their artificial limb project, and he came in to ask for some bolts. And uh, again, and there's a lot of layers, like in terms of our assumption of what kids know too. Um, such a good story. So he comes in and he and he has to get bolts because he wants to reinforce the hinge inside of the arm that he had making. He'd only been using plastic Lego parts, and they were insufficient. So through the testing, he learned that joints actually, in order to lift even something very small, require quite a lot of um, structural um, integrity. So he's learning about structural integrity and how the arm works and all of these things that are layered. When I asked him, like, oh, it's interesting how the bolt fit in that perfect hole that you had before, he's like, yeah, well, because I worked with them before. So he came in with this knowledge and had pre-planned um, sort of the, the design of his device to include knowledge that he had already used. It was, it was just in that, like, 10-minute conversation that I had with this kid that I got to see you know, kind of the potential and the power of constructionism. Wow, thanks Krista and Eileen. So Naomi um, and Kylie, let me turn it back to you. It sounds like that it's deeply, deeply personal in terms of making and tinkering. I think so often within academia, people feel like, oh, that theory, those academics are in their ivory tower and there's no connection to the personal. So could you talk more about this deep kind of situated connection to the personal um, that you've seen at the academic level in terms of making and tinkering? And then we can actually have Krista and Eileen give us some more amazing examples that we just heard. So maybe I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and talk more probably about the personally meaningful kind of uh, notions that Papert had put forward. Yeah, well I think that um, what's really interesting about this, or the, I can sort of see it in some of the work that we've done with uh, e-textiles, and so these sort of solo electronics, the idea that when you sort of put yourself into this artifact, then um, you're able to sort of think through those ideas a little bit more deeply and share them out. Um, it's we, you know, we have kids creating these backpacks and these T-shirts with all these electronics in them, and then going out into the world and saying, "I made this," and being able to explain then, you know, this is what I did here, and you have to connect the positive to positive, and being able to work through that with something that you feel really connected to is a really a uh, powerful way to be able to work through those meanings um, sort of in a way that you can share with other people but also that you're personally very connected to. Right, you know, I think, it, you know, part of the joy of constructionism is that, uh, and there's lots of links to Papert's writings, is that he's just a very cogent writer. You know, um, people <laughs> will ask me from time to time, you know, is his work still relevant? He wrote a lot of this in the 1980s, and, and you go back and you read it, and you're like, oh my gosh, not only is it relevant, it really reshapes the way I should look at learning technologies today. Um, and so, a couple, in a couple of his writings, he's going to talk a little bit about this idea of personally meaningfulness, and that that, that is like a necessity Necessity for learning to happen is that if you don't see it as valuable to yourself, you're just going to tune out. You know, I mean, I have like you know, a lot of friends that, that that just were like, you know, they didn't know what to do with music class, and so it was this time once a week where they just zone out for their 60 minutes, and then they're like, okay, I'm, I'm out of there, and I'm back to my regular class. I mean, these are high achieving students, but but for them, the music class had no personal meaningfulness at all, and so it's, it's a what we call kind of a prerequisite for that learning. And so you're gonna kind of hear that story and that theme kind of happening again and again. You know, beyond that, there's other prerequisites like you know that it needs to be socially and culturally meaningful. So you know, does it have value with the peers and with society at large? And so um, a lot of times you'll see either like a value in maker spaces where kids are actually producing something that will um, uh, you know solve a real world problem like in problem based learning, or it will um, you know they'll be creating a T-shirt or something where um, you know they'll wear it around and their family members or their friends will kind of notice that they're wearing it and have these conversations with them, and and then it'll have some sort of like you know social capital associated with it. Great, thank you. So, 
Krista and Eileen, could you then respond to um, what, what are the ways that you see actually students engaging in the social while they're making? Um, so often it seems like Kylie and Naomi just said that um, schools can be very individualistic and yet making gives us this the opportunity to make it deeply personal but also deeply social. So can you guys give us some concrete examples of what you are seeing at the K-12 setting, whether that's in classrooms or even outside of classrooms after school settings, etc.? I'll give you an idea of how we do it in a school setting uh, in, in terms of collaboration and thinking together as a group. Uh, recently, the students in the make shop um, created, uh, their, their problem to solve was to create a boat that would hold uh, the most weight. And they worked in teams. And um, they, they were given aluminum foil, toothpicks, you know, all kinds of materials. And they had to construct it. So what was interesting is uh, this one child on a team came up at the end, and everyone had constructed things with sails and all kinds of you know kind of interesting pieces. And his was little and flat, with turned up sides. And he said, "I don't want you to think I'm lazy, but my brain told me this would be a good design." And the second grader won second place. He did such a great job. So. Um, I think then what we do is we bring them back into their group and then we take them through um, a reflection and it's Rosebud Thorn. What were the great aspects of this particular uh, problem that you saw? What were the great aspects of this design? What are the um, areas that you need to throw away? And what are the possibilities? And then as a group they have to create a new iteration of the design and send it back out. So um, that's one way we are able to get them to collaborate socially, uh, to engage together, and to create a new product. I love the juxtaposition between the individualization and the socialization of this learning. Um, so thanks for bringing it up. So in terms of individual, individualizing for each student, because it is constructionism, whenever they say, I want to make X, there's going to be a personal gap for every single child between their idea and actually creating that artifact, whether it's learning how to woodwork, knowing how to draw a blueprint, like just the first steps of drawing your idea out could be the gap for them. Maybe they're great working with wood, but just that one step of getting the plan out is a hard gap for them. Um, so that's interesting. And so the other individualization that we do, and a lot of different schools do it in different ways through badge systems or teacher card certifications. Um, which is um, having a resume of skills that you have. And so when I have the kids form groups for their, um, their spring problem in fifth grade, they can be in teams of four, um, but they created the teams based on resumes they had made for themselves in terms of what skills they felt comfortable having used in the fall already or wanted to practice more of, stuff like documentation, electricity, um, using code, scratch, different variations of coding and programming. So that's one way to do the um, to speak to each child. In terms of socialization, they are never learning in isolation, which is sort of like the the, the original model of school, right? Is everyone at their own desk with their own textbook and their own test, and would be cheating to think with someone else or to share information or wording with someone else. Um, there's nothing. There's no such thing as that. As you know, in my classroom, we actually use Google Docs for everything. So all of our words are shared together. They can see each other's craftsmanship change over time. Um, but they also are giving themselves feedback in, in the actual classroom. So at first it's set up very, very structured at the beginning because they don't know what it's like to give critical feedback that's actually beneficial because they want to be kind. They want to say, oh, it's great, it's perfect. And what's something you can add? What can be changed? What, you, what would you have done differently? Should you, would, is there something they should look up a research to understand this better? So that feedback is something that we structure into the day um, at red, like different benchmarks throughout the project until we kind of loosen up a little bit and they start to actually start initiating that themselves. Um, so a quick example recently was uh, they were redesigning the late pass um, for our school and they're, they're designing the sticker that's going to be the late pass inside of a sticker dispenser that they've made. And so they wanted to get everyone's feedback on what colors they should use, what font they should use, and they took data down and, and did surveys. They also used Google Forms for surveys. They love doing that just to get feedback on their stuff. So they use that. Um, and the other form of social learning that we use all the time is the mentoring system. When I came in, I was terrified of not knowing how to use all the technologies that are available, but some kids took to them like they were fish to water and learned how to use the 3D printer a year before I did because I just couldn't carve it out of my time. And so I started noticing that if I could kind of delegate the 
one-on-one -on -one learning, mentoring of a, a specific skill to children, it created actually a, a wonderful dynamic in the classroom where the democracy just shifted, right? It became teacher led everything to whoever knows, whoever's the expert um, gets to be the leader or, or shine in that moment. Um, it's also a really great way to engage certain kids who would feel otherwise left out in your subject, um, whether you're teaching engineering, math, or science, or anything in between. Um, you can actually go to them, invite them to learn a tool specifically to become a mentor. So this has been really um, valuable when getting girls to be leaders in the classroom because a lot of times um, just through no fault of their own because of the way that families are in society is boys usually come by fifth grade having been exposed to some robotics or some soldering and it could be 100% new for a lot of girls. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy to, to deal with. So mentoring for sure has been a big part of the social learning part. Wow, thank you so much for those examples, you two. You know, Kylie and Naomi, I was watching you and you guys were his head just nodding back and <laughs> forth. So talk to us about what's really resonating with you guys as researchers and also um, and you know, kind of push us forward in terms of what questions you have for the K-12 practitioners as well. What resonates and what questions do you have for them? Right. Well, something that's really resonating with me um, that both Eileen and Krista have sort of touched on is this idea of empowerment. Um, and I think that's also related to this conversation topic around um, being personally meaningful. But I think that uh, this, the possibilities with constructionism for empowerment, especially in our lab, we are thinking a lot about getting underrepresented groups, girls, people of color into STEM fields in new ways. Um, and so this idea of being able to create this artifact and how really truthfully empowering that is for people. And then to be able to, to say, like Krista was saying, I am the expert here. I know what I'm talking about. I will share with you this information and let's build something together, I think is a really, really important part of this. Um, I think that you were bringing up, you know, this question of mentors, and I wonder um, just the best, how is how can we do that the best way? How can we, um, this, you know, especially girls not having a lot of expertise, maybe they have no, um, you know, no experience with some of these materials before, how can we make them feel confident enough to learn and to sort of, you know, be able to speak for it and become that expert? Yeah, I, I love that, Naomi, and, and I especially love the example of, of just giving somebody a little bit of a leg up, right? You know, like you know that new technology is coming in, you know, thinking about the kids that have kind of been at the periphery, inviting them to kind of, you know, get the first round of training so that they can be positioned as leaders. I mean, that's a very effective strategy, whether we're talking about science or maker spaces or um, even in, in peer tutoring, like around uh, reading. And, you know, this is a very successful kind of peer-to-peer -peer strategy, and it makes your job so much easier once you develop this robust community um, you know as a teacher is that you know you, you're not in charge of everything you know the whole world doesn't stop if you're out for the day or you know if you if you have something else you need to get done at your computer really quick you know they're not looking to you for that constant set of direction and think about too what that teaches them is that is that, that that's actually how learning happens in our everyday environments um, you know for Pepper he was really thinking about these learning communities you know, a lot of times there's a, a misunderstanding, a sort of like a, um, uh, you know, where we think about Piaget and we think about Papert as cognitive or, or kind of like individual kind of notions of learning. But really, uh, both were quite social cultural in, in a lot of respects. Um, and so you're going to see that in some of the, the newer discussions of even Piaget's work. But Papert in particular, from very, very early on, was started thinking about learning communities and how to create the kind of learning communities that I, that I know are taking place at the schools and the districts that you're, you're hearing from today. But he um, modeled a lot of what he was thinking about in the Samba schools in, um, in uh, South America and thinking about how people taught Samba, right, and, and how intergenerationally this kind of works and how these things are passed down and, and how you learned how to take on dance in these larger festivals. You know, think about the maker movement. We have these larger festivals. We get these chance to to go to a maker fair, whether that's you know kind of a an international maker fair or maybe your school's maker fair to kind of display the products of production, um, you know it's kind of a performance moment in which you're getting ready for, and so there's a lot of scrambling up until those final hours. Um, you know there's there's a lot of peer to peer, even adult mentorship. You know many maker spaces I hear about, um, there's adults in the community that come in and teach the kids how to sew or teach the kids um, a little bit about welding or teach the kids you know some other skill set. 
um, you know, one of the makerspaces they were working on bikes, for example, and a lot of the displaced uh, members of the auto industry had come in to really teach those kinds of skills or uh, farmers and and kind of how to repair things on, on the farm. You know, so it really allows us to kind of not only tap the peer-to-peer -peer networks, but also the parent networks and the grandparents. You know, um, I know Eileen's been doing a lot of work with e-textiles and electronic textiles here recently, but you know, some of the best e-textile designers end up being those with the sewing skills. So when we take this into nursing homes, for example, there's so many grandparents and grandmothers that want to use this these tools and materials to help with their grandkids and their homework. You know, it just provides you know such a rich context in so many ways that are so important. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The grandparents are the best. <laughs> they come from a generation that understood resourcefulness, right? We're losing that generation, so we really need to tap into them and, and value them and, and have them sort of give back. So there's, a lot of them speak about sort of a lost generation. They wanted their kids to be thought leaders. They didn't want them to work with their hands because it was seen as unseemly or not as prestigious. And so their kids are now cycling back and taking, you know, they're taking shop class again. <laughs> so it's really exciting to have those mentors in your neighborhood and especially to value the ones um, that have been makers but don't even know what that word means because they've been using their hands to you know to plant things and to to make food for their communities for a long time and that that brings in a whole big range of minorities in our in our students um, population that have those ties and I actually taught a, a workshop at the library um, like the last two weeks and it's been moms and their daughters and seeing that amazing connection, the moms are having a more impactful like time of it than the girls are because it's all new to them. You know, they're just like, oh, they had nothing, they don't know what to expect. Whereas the moms are having these deep connections to painting and and designing, engineering things, and and saying, you know, this is how I used to spend my childhood, and um, talking about relatives in their past that have, that they can link to. So it creates this these connections in people, and that the socialization is is very personal and and exciting to listen about. Like it's been very inspiring. So what fascinates me is, Kylie, you mentioned this phrase, um, learning communities in which we display the products of production. And it's very obvious to me, looking at behind you guys, that all of you have products of production kind of out there um, showing us what students are doing. And yet, growing up, you know, I grew up in Northern California in the 1980s and 90s, and that to me does not look like school. Right, School seems to be very different with what you guys are talking about. So can you give us more examples for folks that maybe have not been introduced to making, are kind of excited about this notion of constructionism, um, that it may be constructivist in nature as well. Can you give us some more concrete examples of what these products look like and, and why then they are so meaningful? And potentially an argument for why schools should adopt aspects of these maker spaces and making and tinkering. Um, we just gave a briefing this morning and what you're saying really struck me because we had four different school districts in to look at our K-12 um, curriculum alignment and one of the people said this is very threatening to traditional education because um, we have built this makerspace uh, STEAM studios that extend K-12 through and we have the students creating and inventing and designing um, and it's not like anything that's been in a traditional setting before. And um, teachers feel, uh, even though in the beginning teachers have felt threatened by that, maybe this particular group thinks, it's actually done the opposite. It's empowered our teachers now to be innovators. Uh, they're now um, inventing things with 3D printers, which they never thought they would do before. And they're bringing students in who are teaching them what to teach in the classroom, like our third through fifth graders. Um, the other day, they wanted the teacher wanted to teach them to make spin art machines with Lego robotics, and the kids actually sat down and showed the teacher how to do it, created the lesson plan, and we're talking about fourth graders. And then the teacher taught it, and then helped you know basically the students helped teach it. So I think that um, the whole idea of constructionism in a traditional uh, educational setting is. Um, uh, you know, quite a shock <laughs> to the traditional education. And again, just a, a quick overview, like when we start our students in kindergarten, they learn programming, the concepts of programming, and we start them with, you know, basically programming physic with the physical world, we move them into the virtual world with Scratch Junior. Then we start embedding electrical circuitry in K2 with um, little bits, electronics, and with um, squishy circuits. And then by the time they're through um, K2, They've actually embedded 
um, making, making circuitry with scratch and been able to program um, a cardboard piece of material to become a keyboard that plays music. So you can see at each grade level we keep adding the uh, deeper concepts of electrical circuitry with programming, with building and making and design thinking so that at each grade level they can create um, you know, deeper projects. And recently, um, to show what happens as an invention in K2, where you're creating you know, a cardboard keyboard that plays music, um, I just got back with a team of students who created a software application that they, um, uh, it's a, it's a pen-based software application, a flashcard application that they presented at Microsoft Research. So you can see at each level, uh, they're, they're accumulating their knowledge, their skill set, um, and then with intrinsic motivation, they're actually being able to be innovative and create new products. So I think you were asking, is this better than normal school or is this different from normal school? <laughs> um, I've felt very different um, for the last three years practicing problem-based science through the making lens, for sure. Um, I don't think that a lot of my, my immediate colleagues understood it. Um, I think you have to be in the room to understand it. You actually have to see kids and talk to kids to understand it. Like I can, I could get, throw all the data at them and all the articles, but I think it just it doesn't quite sink in until you're, you're physically in the room. And see that it's possible, right? Because a lot of times the, the unstructured um, critique that it gets is sort of its immediate downfall. Oh, that looks too hard. I can't do that. Um, I can't possibly manage a classroom with that many students not knowing what I needed to have ready the next day. That's a different kind of mindset in teaching, right? Is that you have to be prepared and be ready for everything. Um, versus I will figure something out no matter what comes my way. Sort of that flexibility of being the facilitator in the room. So you really have to, and that shift happened slowly for me. It didn't happen overnight, um, for sure. The projects I had were very structured in the beginning, even though they were all hands-on and used all the same technologies, to all the way over here where I give them very simple prompts and just the, the, the vastness of their ideas that comes in, you know, some that are almost impossible, but they always prove me wrong, right, because they stay at it, which is really great. Um, so it's, it's better than school because I think that being good at school is not the same thing as being a scientist or being an artist um, or even being a learner. <laughs> being good at school just means you're good at school. You're good at sort of like um, checklists and your, your time management you know, skills are, are good. And that's, those are all important. But I think that we can teach time management and executive skills and math and literacy and all of these things and even self-assessment through making very very easily and, and it's been eye-opening for me because uh, I've started looking at it completely I feel like I'm a homeroom teacher now because you know I have my kids writing persuasive essays I have them you know managing their own portfolios um, and every day they're doing some form of mathematics which you know I'm not even qualified to teach so I have to pull in some of the, you know our math teachers to assist or even some of the seventh or eighth graders who are learning that geometry or that algebra right now to come help a fifth grader solve a problem right uh, a really cute example of one is this young lady they're designing a cart for one of our um, our staff members as their design challenge they have to find a, a need with an adult on campus and then create a solution to help that need and so he walks around campus a lot and has a lot of tools so they designed a cart for him to keep his tools in and to collect the garbage with. Um, it's also designed based on some of the things that he's passionate about, like certain colors that he likes and um, the trees on campus. But she also wanted to make sure that the handle was comfortable. So she designed a, um, a fabric kind of cuff that would go around the metal um, of the push cart. And in order to know how much fabric to use, she measured the diameter of the actual handle, handle using the calipers and then use the diameter to plug into um, you know, what is the circumference of a circle using pi so that she would know actually what is the actual circumference of the piece of fabric and then use arithmetic and reasoning to figure out that you have to add an inch because when you sew it takes away some of the fabric and voila she was doing geometry and arithmetic on a really simple problem but it's coming in you know in a way that's actually meaningful for that child in that moment and getting applied immediately in a way that's always going to have context for her. Wow, wonderful. Thanks so much, you two. This is, this is really inspiring. Could you tell us the story then of how you, how you all were really on the ground um, helping to nurture these learning communities? I'm assuming that this didn't take place over a week period, right? I mean, this is something that really needs to grow. Could you go, kind of give us the story of how you guys got started? Uh, you can go first. Okay. Um, 
I moved out to California from New York City where I had taught for many, many years and I was introduced to my first MakerBot and um, when I came here it was sort of uh, a school that was willing to take risks and try new things and so it was a really fertile environment for me to say, hey, I might try this thing, it's not going to be super content driven, I don't know what's going to happen, but everyone says it's going to, you know, it's going to be great and so they gave me a year to try that, um, an experiment and for three years I've been experimenting with what this can look like when you give them an entire year, their entire sixth grade science or their entire fifth grade science curriculum to just do this kind of problem solving. And it's been really, really rewarding as well as a, a big learning curve. I've learned a lot about assessment as well. So it, it's taken a while. You know, changing the mindset of the school is part of that. Having to like explain to families and explain to administration how this is different and why it can supplement what we're already doing and maybe even eventually supplant what we're already doing. Takes time. <laughs> um, for us, it's been a five-year process. Uh, we consider computational thinking the new literacy, so we developed um, a curriculum that goes alongside a traditional curriculum. We started with just eight students in an after-school scratch team, a girls' team, and we started in the middle school. And now we serve 1,800 students um, using block-based code, uh, not only in our own district, but um, in outreach pro programs that we do with other districts. And basically, it started again in simple after-school activities, but they were driven into the curriculum by the students themselves. An example is, when we started uh, after-school scratch clubs, we thought we'd be lucky to have 15 students. We had 65. Those 65 students came to the classes and said, will you send this to my teacher? I want him to see my program. So we would send it to the teachers, and the teachers would write back, will you come into our classrooms? So then we started going into classrooms, and teachers would adopt it in the way that they felt you know, worked best with their curriculum. Uh, one teacher gave us a whole day, and he um, did a project like um, Don't Let the Pigeon ride the bus, drive the bus, and they created their own scratch project that way. And another teacher was doing figurative language, so we came in for a couple of sessions to help with figurative language. But the whole point is, now through the years, we've built this um, block-based coding from K through 5, transitioning to 7th um, grade. Well, I want to say a series of block-based code. They start with Scratch, Scratch Junior. Um, they start with um, Lego robots. We start adding extensions with motors and sensors. By the time they get to three, four, and five, it's um, we've built in more classrooms. So we have instructional uh, technology literacy class, which teaches the programming on a regular daily basis. And then they go into the STEAM lab, and they do the design build with motors and sensors and the innovation there. And then by the time they get into seventh grade, they do um, App Inventor, and they create mobile um, apps for their mobile um, mobile devices, and then they are um, transitioning into text-based code. And then by the time they get to the high school, they have the opportunities, again, for Java 1, Java 2, AP Computer Science, but it's really the after-school connected learning uh, where the students are actually getting to be the most innovative right now. And we have teams of students that have um, a bus buddy team that has created an app that when little students get on the bus, they scan with an NFC code and um, it sends an alert to parents saying, Johnny's on the bus at 2.30, and then Johnny's off the bus. And so all these teams are starting to you know, go deeper and um, take us further. So um, again, it's, um, it's taken a long process. We're now uh, doing outreach to um, the region through a, a, a grant through the Grable Foundation. They've asked us to make innovation happen, not just between partner schools, but now through the region. So I feel like it's a movement. Uh, it's a very important movement that's starting to uh, take place in public school systems, uh, definitely in our region and I think all over the country. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those examples. Kylie and Naomi, don't feel like I'm forgetting about you. I want to turn it back to you guys and really have you tie this back to constructionism because what I heard from the K-12 practitioners is that you really have to dive in and so it sounds like the kids are there. The kids are ready and it, there might be a layer of teacher professional development here, teacher education. Could you talk to us from your perspective of working with teachers, maybe being involved in the credential program, graduate levels with in-service educators, what are you noticing about making and how does that connect to constructionism if we talk about teacher or educator professional development? Does that make sense, you guys? 
Oh, absolutely. I think this is a key question, especially if there's anybody out there like saying, oh, you know, that sounds really challenging or, you know, these must be super rock stars. And of course they are that are adapting this in their classroom. But part of it is, is, is this own personal construction of story, right? You know, you become uh, this kind of educator by actually doing it yourself. So if you notice that you're just kind of watching your kids, um, this might be your kids at home, this might be your kids in your classroom doing the fun and cool things, give yourself the permission to try it out. Right. Give yourself the permission to, um, you know, play with the 3D printer or to explore the new application on your desktop. Um, to do something kind of off task on your iPad. Right. It's this tinkering mentality um, that doesn't really have a goal in the normal sense, but just this this broad kind of based exploration. Um, so when we do professional development, and actually, you know, we work uh, with Eileen. Actually, um, we'll be there this summer. We've we've worked with her for the past several years during the summers to prepare for teachers to go into this. And and we, we've worked with people all over the spectrum, you know, from people that are just the ready adapters, right, you know, which are going to be some small percentage of the population, to the folks that are like, no, this is not for me. And, um, and you know, we have to, to work together as a community to kind of embrace these things. Um, and so the best way to do that is just to get people started in the making. Um, adults in particular are, have a fair feel of failure, especially immediately. Um, so kind of giving them, you know, the leg up that Krista was talking about before is actually important. So having like a summer session with them, kind of a, an after school session um, so they can start to get going. Um, you know, what, what I know Eileen's strategy um, has been to pull in educators from the art teacher that was completely technophobic, right, and, and had not wanted to adopt these technologies, um, you know, to the science teachers, to the folks that, that were already doing some programming in their classroom. And, and create kind of a mixed environment where they could help each other. Um, you know, the literacy teachers, you know, this is kind of that kind of cross-cutting kind of ways of, of thinking about the schooling curriculum. There's actually something in here for everyone. Um, and I think the benefit is, is by the time you set them up that they feel most confident to try it out the very first time, they can kind of start to see how engaging it is, not just for the kids they've always been successfully able to engage, but the kid that's back in the corner that they haven't been able to reach. And all of a sudden, you know, it repositions yourself as, as an instructor. And I think you've, you've heard Krista kind of saying, well, then it allowed me to think about peer peer mentoring models or to foster this kind of interaction in the classroom. And so it starts to shift um, your role as the teacher, not as the expert content knower, the, the person who's great at reading and writing and arithmetic and, and you know, science and has all the answers, but really thinking about being a co-learner with your students, right? Um, that it's okay if they know more than you. That's a really hard shift for most educators, is that that feels scary. It feels like my administrator is going to doubt my professional ability. Um, but, you know, it only takes, you know, kind of, you know, the first few times you try it, you're not going to be comfortable with this. But after a couple months of kind of working in this manner, you'll be ready to sort of relinquish the control of the classroom, and you'll be able to kind of see how much time you get back and how much energy for teaching, right, that you that you have in the process. Yeah, yeah I'll modeling that probably. mindset. Yeah, definitely. No, I just wanted to throw in that um, in our in, in at Indiana University, we are um, sort of in the process of thinking of opening a makerspace in our School of Education. Um, that's sort of about this idea to allow pre-service teachers and faculty members, uh, graduate students, to actually go in and tinker. You know, try to make some things and think, think about how they could use it in their classroom. Not just talk about it because in the past, you know, in learning theory classes, pre-service teachers might talk about constructivism and talk about constructionism, but never actually have their hands on any of the materials and actually get to make meaning through that themselves. And so we're starting to sort of create some of these experiences that we think are going to be really, really interesting for that kind of professional development opportunity. I think what this brings to mind is a new soft skill that teachers have to have, and that's courage. They have to have the courage to create, and they have to be brave. And part of that comes with confidence. So what you're doing by starting a pre-service makerspace is you're allowing them to have confidence for the first time and experiment before they get in a scarier situation where it's um, students that they need to manage. So um, that's been one lesson we've learned, that uh, to be courageous. Something that I recently um, has sort of like crystallized in my brain because these words have been kind of bouncing around in my head for over a year and, and I didn't feel like I strongly understood them enough to be here today to explain them to people and then so I did a lot of reading and um, and 
I know that I'm doing it, and so I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> so a lot of what I do is have the kids um, work through the design process. Um, the design process is a really great way for them to get exposed to sort of the steps of learning because there's so much iteration and going back and testing and all the things that are necessary and the reflection piece that are all necessary to sort of document the work, to um, solidify the understanding. And I got that from a paper that I, I'm not sure when it came out because there's no date on the actual cover, but it's called Transforming Constructivist Learning into Action, Design Thinking and Education. It came out of the House of Plattner Institute. And it makes a lot of sense <laughs> that if teachers are afraid of how to start this, if it seems too messy, just fall back on something that's already like, exploding in schools all over the place, which is using the design thinking process um, to start working through the constructionist environment in a way that starts to feel safer and safer the more that you do it. That would be my advice for that. That is excellent advice. Um, as a district, we started sending all our administrators and now little by little our teachers to design thinking um, webinars with Luma Institute. So they're learning the design thinking process so that they can be better equipped in the classroom. And I think that moving, like you talk about how do districts adopt this, we started it as a grassroots program, but then it became policy. Because when we had reached the point that we couldn't reach another teacher, we didn't have enough capacity, then we started creating a STEAM studio and a makerspace. And we started adding teachers who now bring 60 kids at a time into the classroom, and they actually do the makerspace together and then move back out. So the teachers now have the confidence and support because they have a STEAM teacher leading the process and they're there for embedded professional development. They're learning with the students. What we're really finding out is in our um, summer institute, we're actually embedding students to come on, like on one day when they're learning Lego robotics, the second day we say bring your child. Because when a teacher sees the um, engagement and the, and the excitement that a child has when they're learning, then they're, they relax and they're ready. They, they know that the kids take over and they see it happen in front of their eyes. So I think that we're kind of changing our model to make sure that teachers are embedded with students while students learn so that it's all a community opportunity. Yeah, you're designing for your user every day as a teacher, right? Or we should be. Like we shouldn't be getting sort of a stock curriculum that they are all going to identify with in any way. You're on a constant basis designing with each student, oh, well, I think you're going to need to go in this route <laughs> if this is where you want to go, and I'll point you in the right direction over here. So it, it's a totally different relationship that you have with your students in a very good way. Wow, thank you. Well, so we brought up design and designing your learning environments and design thinking. We have a question from the chat roll related to design. Could you guys share the design of your tech setup is how it's phrased. Are they one-on-one, -on -one, iPad, tablets? Is there computer and laptop access? Uh, could you talk to us about the design of these spaces and these learning opportunities? Um, if, if I were to talk about our STEAM studios, we have been one of the districts who has the least amount of technology probably within our region until this year we're starting a one-to-one -one initiative. So the way we've done it is we've scheduled computers, brought them into, the, into these rooms, these STEAM studios, and then divided them into collaborative teams. So students work together, usually, um, usually four students per computer or per project. So it can be done uh, first of all with freeware and it can be done with limited amount of technology. Now that we're moving one-to-one -one, it's a whole different story but um, the STEAM spaces they're basically um, a STEAM studio space with a STEAM teacher and then usually two, at, at grades three through five two teachers come in at a time with the STEAM teacher with 60 students in a classroom. You can hear a pin drop when they're in the uh, you know at, that's at certain points. I mean they are fully engaged in others and very quiet when they need to listen. It's been beautiful and easy to manage because they are so, again, engaged in the process. At K2, our makerspace is, um, again, led by a STEAM teacher. The teachers of the classroom are expected to come in with their students. It's embedded professionalism, again, embedded, embedded professional development. So they are learning with the STEAM teacher. And then what we're seeing happening is it's starting to go out into the classrooms. It's starting to go into math. It's starting to go, the concepts they're learning, they're starting to go out into the traditional education. So um, that's you know, the power of this um, STEAM learning. Um, by technology, you mean the stuff that plugs in? 
Yeah. Um, so the stuff that plugs in mostly, um, we have a one-to-one -one iPad program that we've had for, I think, about four years now. Um, and they are as useful as your smart device is to you, right, as a professional. So think of them as learners in their setting. They use them to email teachers. They use them to keep track of their grades and their assignments. They use them to research with. They use Google Docs on them to compose with. Um, and they, they use... Um, the camera function a lot to document their work, so that's that's kind of our structure. Other than that, we have the laser cutter and the 3D printer as sort of our staple digital fabrication tools, and then everything else is sort of something you could have in any classroom. You can have the hand tools in a box or in a little carryout crate and bins full of stuff that can be prototyped with. Great, thanks so much. So, Kylie, Naomi, can you talk to us then? Because I'm hearing that there's really something for everyone, and it kind of across the spectrum in terms of technology. There's low tech and sewing, knitting, etc., all the way up to high tech. And Eileen talked about little bits and programming. What does constructionism say about this? Kind of this high tech endeavor. I mean, especially if this was written um, in the 1980s. Right. So that, you know, when we think about, it's not so much that you need to worry about your uh, makerspace being high tech or low tech, right? That's going to be valued to all sorts of types of making. We know from, you know, professional scientists and, and um, you know, rocket scientists and, and everyday kind of STEM professionals is that these early experiences in making are pretty much a commonality. You know, most folks have kind of had an early experience building their own boat, uh, working in, in the wood shop, you know, um, sewing a quilt, you know, all of this stuff starts to develop, um, you know, parts of our brain in really unique kinds of ways that then allow us to think very differently and visually, um, you know, kind of be able to map out these learning spaces. Um, so in our, my opening remarks, I had mentioned this idea of an object to think with. This becomes really important as you start to pick and choose your tools. So some tools will teach you some things, and some tools will teach you other things. Um, and so you need to pick your tools to map onto your educational objectives. Um, so this might mean you know you want to teach um, the laws of physics. And so we've been exploring uh, you know building uh, roller coasters out of just paper and tape for example, very low cost with a bunch of marbles and paper and tape, and it becomes this way of thinking about, um, you know, the laws of physics and, and, um, and uh, dynamics and, and real, um, you know, construction time. This has applications, you know, for the early grade levels as well as the late grade levels. Um, if you're learning about circuitry, for example, you can do that through squishy circuits or e-textiles. Um, so each one of those kind of has unique affordances. The cool thing, you know, we study learning, and so what we're interested in is, is what are the unique affordances of these new materials for learning, and we're actually finding these new ones that start to involve technology actually are starting to become better than the traditional ones we've offered in schools. Uh, the circuitry toolkits being a really good prime example of that is that it's always been hard for kids to learn the basics of circuitry. If you're thinking, yeah, I remember having that or I teach that, but the details are a little bit vague and fuzzy to me. You're not alone. That's pretty much you know what we see of, of college students uh, entering that are majoring in physics or engineering. Um, so a lot of these big content ideas requires that we do this kind of construction space learning. Is we need to make these materials ourselves. We need to have the right toolkits. And so when you play around, you're surfacing things that will actually teach the right math content. We're exploring right now how traditional sewing um, can be related to mathematics. I know a, um, a, a teacher in uh, LUSD that actually got permission to do an all applied mathematics class at the high school level. And so she's teaching math through game design, teaching math through sewing. Um, you know, this is the kind of sticky ways to think about um, math in context, right? It's not an abstract formula. It's the kind of thing that Krista had talked about, about calculating the circumference to then get the area to get this measurement just right, right? You know, so you, you, um, you know, these are the kinds of things you never forget, right? You know, so we've been, been less, uh, less thinking about, um, about how much learning, but really thinking about how sticky this learning can be. And these, these kind of makerspace projects really make a lot of big ideas very salient. So Papert himself was very interested in thinking about new tools to enable new big ideas, um, powerful ideas, enabled to, to even the youngest of learners. And so, uh, you know, he was writing at a time when the computer was a room. 
right? And, and he was envisioning this idea that the computer could then become a desktop tool for children in the ways that, that you've just heard about here. Um, that, it was laughable at the time he was writing, like, I can't even imagine, why, what would a kid do with this kind of thing? He had to invent new computer programming languages so that kids could control the medium of the computer. And we're starting to actually see this vision, you know, that, that you know, is decades old at this point, actually start to come to fruition. I mean, the kids are really taking control of these devices. Wonderful. Naomi, do you have anything to add? Oh, I'm just really inspired, I think, listening to everyone, sort of their uh, constructionism and practice and the way that these students are really being able to, as Kylie was saying, control these devices. Um, we find really interesting intersections between this high-tech and low-tech idea, so not that one is better than the other or that um, you need, you know, I think that uh, when they come together is when things can become really interesting. So, you know, uh, cardboard robotics and fabric, you know, fabric circuitry and all of this stuff is a really interesting way to start to think about really the uses of technology and what it's for and what we can do with it. Um, it was really interesting in these intersections. All right. Thanks so much, you guys. We are almost out of time, so I'm going to put you guys on the spot. You ready? You have to name your favorite resource related to constructionism. Okay, your favorite resource related to constructionism, it can be anything. All right, so can I pick on someone? Krista, I'm going to go to you. Well, I mentioned that one before. I thought it was pretty helpful. Um, and this one really laid it out for me a little bit. Are you talking about like this kind or like reading one? Okay, the one that was put out by Dacto, Constructionism, Tools to Build and Think With. It really helped it sort of simplify for me kind of what are the tenets of it, like what needs to be present. So just read, reading. But I'm a nerd. I like to read. I love nerds. Thank you so much. Eileen, how about you? I think, Kylie, you have a book out on e-textile design. I'm, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, that's our go-to. Uh, it's amazing. Yes, I really, uh, we love that. I think we, the kids, I, I want to say that's the one they were so emotionally attached to, is the e-textile design project. Every fourth grader created um, with an Arduino board. LED lights that blinked on and off and sewed them into a shirt, and that really was the most powerful for us. All right, so Kylie, talk to us about interconnections, please. Yeah, well, interconnections is a is a um, a, a co-designed effort with National Writing Project, and it's a book series that spans you know kind of four different types of making that you'd be interested in and in bridging into your classroom. We notice that there's a gap. You know, you need to you need to build quickly. You need to have materials to to um, you know talk to your administrator about to to create an opening like this if you don't already have so. You need to have the standards alignment, and you need to have robust uh, curriculum materials. So we worked with an elite. A group of uh, National Writing Project teachers in the co-design process, and now these are available through MIT Press with lots of free materials to download. The, the book itself is, is full color and, and less than $30, so, so we're, we're really happy with the product. All right, thanks. And Naomi, finish us off with your favorite constructionist resource. Right. Well, uh, you know, this is all coming from Papert. We've been talking about him a lot. And so his website, papert.org, is just has um, his pretty much entire list of his writings. He didn't really write a lot, but it's all really deep and interesting, but also pretty easy to read. And so just that site website um, that has such a list of everything he's talked about and sort of in a timeline is really, really useful. Great. Thanks so much. And I promise, audience members, we're going to make sure we get you all those links to interconnections, to all the readings we've mentioned, um, et cetera. All right. So don't, don't worry. You're in good hands. So we're almost out of time. So we want to take this last minute to thank our panelists. Thanks so much, you guys. I have learned a ton. Um, and thank you all for watching and folks in the chat room. We appreciate your comments and questions. If you're interested in learning more about Connected Learning, make sure to check out the Connected Learning Alliance site at clalliance.org where there are tremendous testimonials from practitioners and informative multimedia pieces. If you'd like to keep abreast of future opportunities from educator, innovator, and partners like the ones we heard about today, sign up for the monthly newsletter at educatorinnovator.org and follow Educator Innovator at Twitter at innovates underscore ed. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys, and have a wonderful Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.